Good evening, I'm John Carter and welcome to Poland Daily. Volodymyr Zelensky has knocked out Petro Poroshenko in the second round of the Ukrainian presidential elections. Zelensky won over 73% of the votes to Poroshenko's 24%. Joy has taken over in Zelensky's headquarters. Volodymyr Zelensky has won the second round of elections. Volodymyr Zelensky is a political newcomer known first and foremost from a popular Ukrainian TV series Servant of the People, in which the president elect played the role of a schoolteacher who runs for president and wins. Of course, apart from the conversation in Minsk, I think that our main task now is to rescue all of our captured citizens and soldiers. I will tell you, I don't know whether I have the legal right to save them, as I haven't yet gotten my presidential status officially, but I have talked with the parents of the Ukrainian mariners that are being held against their will, and we cannot remain passive. I will do everything that's in my power to bring them home. The Polish president's chancellery has stated that the president Duda has been on the phone with the winner of the election. President Andrzej Duda has congratulated to the Ukrainian president-elect Volodymyr Zelensky and invited him to Poland. The Prime Minister of Russia, Dmitry Medvedev, is hoping that under the new leadership in Ukraine, it will be easier to normalize its relations with Russia. Petro Poroshenko has admitted his defeat and congratulated his rival. The parting president has announced that he's not leaving politics. Never give up. This is a phrase that I'm hearing now when I see results of the polls. They are clear, and they give me the basis to call my contestant and congratulate him. Dear Ukraine, this month I will give up my position as head of state. This is a decision made by majority of Ukrainians, and I agree with that decision. I am leaving office, but I want to state clearly that I'm not leaving politics. Zelensky won in all circuits in his country, except from the Lvov district, while Poroshenko got majority of the votes. The final results will be announced by the Central Electoral Commission on May 4th. 290 people have been killed and more than 500 wounded after a series of bombings on Easter Sunday in Sri Lanka. According to authorities, the attack was carried out by seven suicide bombers from a radical Islamic organisation. Today, another explosion took place in the capital, Colombo. The attacks were carried out on Sunday morning in three Catholic churches in the capital of Colombo and two other cities during Easter Mass. At the same time, bombs exploded in the restaurants of three luxury hotels in Colombo. I think it's a very serious situation that was intended to destabilize our country and economy. I condemn this attack on religious institutions and hotels in the capital. According to the authorities, the attack was carried out by seven suicide bombers from a radical Islamic organization called NTJ. Because of the attack, a curfew has been introduced. Also, social media activity has been suspended. 24 people were detained in the investigation undertaken by the authorities. All suspects come from Sri Lanka. Eyewitnesses spoke of the horrible effects of the explosions. I heard an explosion first, then the roof fell on our heads. We took our children and ran out through the back doors. My brother-in-law and his son are in hospital. The State Security Council held a meeting in Colombo. The meeting touched on the subject of disregarding a warning about the possibility of attacks. Similar warnings have been previously conveyed by American services. Polish President Andrzej Duda and the Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki both posted their condolences on Twitter on behalf of Poland. The tragedy that happened in Sri Lanka is shocking. On Easter Sunday, we especially connect with the suffering and the injured people. We support the desperate people spiritually. Despite the special holiday season, it's hard to hold back anger against brutal and cynical terrorists attacking what's most important. The attacks in churches and hotels in Sri Lanka are a huge tragedy. It's very painful because it happened on the day when the entire Catholic Church celebrates the resurrection of Jesus. Especially today, let us remember all those who were persecuted because of their faith. There are several dozen foreigners among the victims of the attacks, including a number of Americans, Brits and Danes. On Easter Monday, Pope Francis stressed that Christ's resurrection calls on each of us to bring the Easter message of hope and life to the world. The Pope also offered prayers for the hundreds killed and injured in the series of bombings in Sri Lanka. 
May the living Christ grant his peace to the entire beloved African continent, still rife with social tensions, conflicts, and at times violent forms of extremism that live in their wake in security, distraction, and death. May a new page open in the history of that continent in which all political, social, and religious components actively commit themselves to the pursuit of the common good and the reconciliation of the nations. May we let ourselves be renewed by him. Happy Easter. According to the latest opinion poll from Estimator, the ruling United Right Coalition, fronted by the Law and Justice Party, is widening the gap to its nearest rival, the European Coalition. That's ahead of the European elections. The Conservative United Right Coalition is in line for 41,6% of the vote, while the European Coalition can expect 36,6%. Two other parties would make it past the electoral threshold of 5%. The newly founded Social Liberal Spring Party, led by Robert Biedron, polled 8,8%, while the right-wing populist cookies movement received 6,1%. The Polish elections to the European Parliament will take place on May 26. Tired of people endlessly staring into their smartphones on your night out? Welcome to the Polish capital, Warsaw, where, at a recent venue, 2,000 recycled mobile phones were attached to the walls of a room for an all-night house party, with music from Warsaw-based DJ duo Last Robots. <laughs> Taking a month together and a week to mount, the concept of a LED mobile phone wall came from local resident Karolina Gilon, who felt phones negatively impacted on the way people socialize at parties. After entering a competition run by drinks brand Desperados to co-host the latest in a series of epic parties, Gilon wanted to focus her guests' attention on the dance floor and away from being on their phones. People spend an average of 3 hours and 43 minutes per day on their mobile phones, according to the company's press release, and there is a growing trend trend of unplugged parties where phones are banned or locked away. The Warsaw Club Night was the first in a year-long series of epic parties imagined by you events to collect global party ideas and create the first crowdsourced party called Your Fest in September. Techno and house DJ Seth Droxler, who created the track Me, You, Us for the series, is expected to headline. Are you ready? Thank you very much for joining us here this evening at Poland Daily. I'm John Carter. Stay tuned after the break for Poland Daily weather. It's followed by the business. Stay tuned for the culture, history and lastly the travel. Welcome to Poland Daily Weather. Let's see the forecast for tonight. In most regions, sky will be overcast. The temperature will range from 3 degrees in Białystok to 5 on the southwest and in Gdańsk and Rzeszów. Let's see the forecast for tomorrow. Sunlight will appear across the Poland. The most sun is expected on the north. Temperature will range from 16 to 19 degrees in Warszawa. Gusty wind is expected along the Baltic coast. Rainfall will appear around Zielona Góra, Katowice, Wrocław and Kraków. Let's check the weather for the next days. On Wednesday, temperature will range from 70 to 19 degrees. On Thursday, temperature will rise the highest temperature we will see on the southwest, 24 degrees. On Friday, rainfall will appear on the northwest. Temperature will increase again to 27 degrees in central Poland. Thank you for watching and see you soon. On Daily Business Edition, our guest is Grant Blaisdell, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And we'll speak tonight about the space business because you are family tied to the famous space entrepreneur, your mother. Yeah, yeah, I have. And, um, but she's, she's been, as we were discussing a moment ago, she's been at the forefront of, of multiple things multiple times over the past um, decades, including historically here in Poland um, as well. So her venture into, let's say, we like to call it the space economy, is you know her her newest, let's say, long time passion. Right. We speak a few days after the SpaceX reached the milestone landing three uh, cores mm -hmm. of the SpaceX Heavy, including 
to, um, I don't know how to say, say in English, the, the things that are covering the satellite. Mm -hmm. uh, previously, they were very difficult to reuse. Right now, they are remanufactured, landed in the water, and they will be reused very soon. So that brings the cost of the transportation to orbit of one or two magnitudes down. Mm -hmm. That means, according to the f simple uh, uh, analysis, or analysis yeah, <laughs> it means that there will be a number of customers who would like to go to the orbit. Yep. And this is like a f first or, or, or another iteration of Gold Rush. Well, one, one thing um, Eva's focused on, um, and you know, I, I advise and, and am involved where I can, uh, is not just to focus on what you're talking about, and this is why I choose not to say space industry and I say space economy, is because that rocket is just one, one tiny portion of everything that surrounds this entire economy, mm -hmm. which is, well, the manufacturer for the parts. There's multiples. It's not coming out of SpaceX. SpaceX isn't building that, right? Or at least not most of it. Um, there's an entire economy if you go to H&M, you go to any big stores, walk around on the street, you see how much NASA and space as, is culturally relevant and is monetizable as a cultural element. Um, and all of this economy that you see across the software developers, independent, small students, etc., it's all distributed. Right? It's an entirely distributed economy that has no connection, meeting points. Ah, the and guys are meeting with uh, big companies, doing something for them, and they don't know about each other, yeah. even if they are in the same district of yeah. the same town. Or um, there's, no, you know, there's no marketplace for it either. So even with like airplanes, I mean, we're going a little bit down out of space on Earth, but it's the same idea. You know, there's an entire needed marketplace for machine parts. And you're talking about reusability, right? So there's, there's millions of these little points that all need to be connected and all these entities need to be met and done so with trust. So something that Eva's really been forward thinking about as you know, you've met her before, I believe, and uh, is approaching using technology to build an economic system and marketplace for the space economy. So we can shoot as much stuff as we want you know, in a space, but unless we on Earth figure out some sort of model and system to be able to handle that new element, then then it's going to be harder. M most of the added value of the economy that will come from the space will be realized here on Earth until we have those orbital cities or whatever. Well, but I think tokenization is, you know, I'm from the blockchain space. I think tokenization is going to be a huge element of this economy and industry on, on both sides, which is the biggest thing in space industry is IP, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Who owns it? How is it shared? How is it distributed? How is it monetized? And how is that distributed, right? So that technology can solve that in an amazing way. And also, once we get into mining, so how do you, you know, mining in yeah. space on Ashley, how, how do you digitally in the real world with trust represent that asset, right? So it's going to be tokenization of, of physical assets into a digital space, identities tied to it, and it's going to be moving around these marketplaces. So it's going to be fascinating, to be honest. And, and Eva says, I, you know, let's, let's make it better on Earth first before we figure out the space. Right, space and then will be hundreds of thousands of the businesses that are spin-off that are based on the fashion for space, new interest of the yeah. people for space. Yeah. We had that in 1970s. They actually, the guys who lived through that are now in their 50s, yeah. but uh, the new things are coming. Yeah, well, Eva's really trying to push that, that culture element of it, which is reignite. Fashion. Yeah, reignite the American passion into space and understand that, you know, that's, that's something that really propelled and, and brought the country together. Uh, the, the space is also a driver of uh, um, innovation. The space mm -hmm. is driver of new economies, and with that fashion, you you got to, you take the new young people, ambitious, mm -hmm. uh, extremely capable, of to go and forward to the science, to technology, to the things like like blockchain, yeah. in order to use it in the big space project. And that's 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 a civilizational thing, I guess. Uh, yeah, I think. Um you, it's really hard. You've, I don't think you've ever run into somebody and you're like, hey, 
you like space, you know, no, I hate it. Like, you, you don't run into that. So th I think there's an, an innate natural passion in human beings around this subject. You know, the unknown and, and being able to conquer the unknown, progress. Mm -hmm. I mean, no matter what side you are on the economic or political aisle, uh, you know, I think that sort of progress is something that, that people can all tie behind. Well, we don't speak about that much in Poland, but we should, definitely. Um, the, your idea of tokenization of uh, this, how, how it should work in, in the real world? Uh, well, I'm, I'm very much use case kind of based. So um, let's, say, uh, let's say you have an independent software developer in his basement, and he created something that's really great that can be applied to microsatellites. On the flip end, you have a major, you know, put in whatever, Boeing's, you know, the major providers on this end. Um, they are looking for stuff like that, but they can't be everywhere. They don't, they don't have the insight or the access or the cultural insight into everything. They can't listen to every pitch. Right. Um, so you have a central meeting point. This person has their IP that's registered in blockchain, it's tokenized, and it's tied to their identity that they have tied to them that they created. Same thing on Boeing on the other end. They meet at a central point. Let's say this person puts out the terms right away. So he says, I want to license it for two years at a million dollars, right? That's automatically part of the offer on the marketplace. Boeing comes in, sees that, they say, okay, I match it, I do it, they trigger it. Smart contract creates the whole situation. Funds get transferred. That token that represents the IP goes to Boeing. After two years, comes back, right? And you don't need a middleman. Yes, you're going to have third-party applications. So you're going to have the marketplace manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're not going to have middlemen that are needed to handle any aspect of that. And yeah, if I've, it needs to go to litigation, that's a different thing. I've been part several times in those meetings of the young, enthusiastic startup yeah, yeah. things, and I was, like, tired after after fifth talking yeah. to the guys who were trying to sell me yeah. their ideas. And I can imagine I, I, I wasn't listening to the best of those guys because if there is a 60 companies, how could you possibly listen to all of them? Yeah, and yeah. and th this is the situation well, that we face. It. And uh, th this is the shape of the future, actually. Yeah, I, I believe so. And, and the cool thing about systems like that is that I run into people all that it can be applied to so many things. I come out of digital media, so actually the model for that was built for digital content for what you guys are doing here. Yeah. Um, well, I appreciate what you do, and Thank hopefully you. this will be realized in very soon future. Grant Blaisdell was our guest. Thank Pleasure. you very much. And that was it for Thanks tonight's for having Poland Daily Business. Welcome back to Poland Daily Weather. Let's see the forecast for tomorrow. Sunlight will appear across the Poland. The most sun is expected on the north. Temperatures will range from 16 to 19 degrees in Warsaw. Gusty wind is expected along the Baltic coast. Rainfall will appear around Zielona Góra, Katowice, Wrocław and Kraków. Let's see the forecast for our continent. In northern and eastern Europe will expect rainfall. In Rome, thunderstorms will appear. The lowest temperatures, 8 degrees, is expected in Helsinki and in Vienna. In Central Europe, temperatures will range about 20 and 22 degrees. The hottest capitals in Europe are London and Zagreb with 23 degrees. Goodbye and see you soon. Welcome to Poland Daily Culture. Today we will be going back to the 16th century and we will see the museum of Jan Kochanowski. It was printed in 1579. This year is the 440th anniversary of the first appearance of this work, which brought Kochanowski fame not only in Poland, but also beyond its borders. Kohanowski was aware of the amount of publications of the Psalter made until the first half of the 17th century. 
we can claim that his pen work brought the artist a lot of income. And it wasn't that easy during that time, because it was quite hard to make a living from writing poetry. Kohanovsky was a lucky man in a sense that he was famous and considered an outstanding artist in life. His poetry was known in two circulations. People were reading his manuscripts way before they were taking to the publishing house, especially epigrams. They were rewritten and quoted many times during various meetings and noble councils. He was very popular. He was valued as a poet. At the time when the hymn 25th, which starts with the encrypt, What do you want from us, Lord, reached Poland, everyone was astonished. This was the very first known piece that Kochanowski wrote in Polish. A poet 25 years older than Kochanowski, Mikołaj Rey, was amazed by this poem. He wanted to show Kochanowski respect by giving him the priority when it comes to artistic output. Kochanowski was the first Polish writer of that period of time who created literature at a high artistic level. It is said that poets used only rhythms at that time. And Jan Kochanowski was a poet who took Polish poetry into the higher level of world's poetry. He did that by introducing multiplicity of literary genres, which Poland didn't have and didn't know before. He did that thanks to his humanistic studies. He studied at the University of Padua, which was one of the most important universities in Europe at that time. Padua itself, a very well-developed economically city, at the university that educated in a very modern way. That's where Kohanowski gained humanistic knowledge based precisely on the works of distinguished poets of the ancient times. He also developed his foreign languages knowledge. He spoke Greek, Latin, and probably Hebrew. He read books in Greek. All this shaped his personality in the spirit of Renaissance humanism. He tried to convey to Poland everything he learned there. It was very risky sometimes, because he was the first experimenter in the field of literature. A good example here will be the dismissal of the Greek envoys, which was the first drama written in Polish. But at the same time, it keeps this ancient spirit because it contains the three basic principles, the action, place and time. Actually, Kochanowski wrote this drama, but he never thought that it can be seen on the stage of the theater. He doubted. He wrote it for himself. And then a fantastic opportunity appeared. I have to mention that besides Piotr Mushkevich, Zamoyski was also a wonderful humanist who studied at the University of Padua. He was surrounded by men of letters of that time. He was a close friend of Kochanowski and not only young, but also his brother, Andrzej. He was motivating both of them to write. He wrote several pieces for Jan Zamoyski. He never dedicated them to him, but he wrote them at his request. And the dismissal of the Greek envoys was performed for the first time in January 1578 at the wedding of Jan Zamoyski and Krystyna Radziwiłł. This was a very artful and expensive undertaking because a completely new scene was built just for this purpose. King Stephen Batore was present at the performance together with his wife Anna Jagiellon. Kochanowski didn't make it to the premiere. Some survived source materials say that he didn't feel well. Therefore, he didn't make it. But he was greatly touched by the fact that his own work was performed for the first time in front of the king and the entire royal suit. Jan Kochanowski was a Polish Renaissance poet who established poetic patterns that would become integral to the Polish literary language. He is commonly regarded as the greatest Polish poet before Adam Mickiewicz and the greatest Slavic poet prior to the 19th century. Kochanowski was born at Sycyna near Radom, Poland. Little is known of his early education. At 14, fluent in Latin, he was sent to the Kraków Academy. After graduating in 1547, at age 17, he attended the University of Königsberg in Ducal Prussia and Padua University in Italy. 
At Padua, Kohanovsky came in contact with the great humanist scholar Francesco Robotello. Kohanovsky closed his 15-year period of studies and travels with a final visit to France, where he met the poet Pierre Ronsard. In 1559, Kohanovsky returned to Poland for good, where he remained active as a humanist and Renaissance poet. He spent the next 15 years close to the court of King Sigismund II Augustus, serving for a time as royal secretary. Kohanovsky settled on a family estate at Czarnolas, Blackwood, to lead the life of a country squire. In 1575, he married Dorota Podlodowska, with whom he had seven children. Kohanowski is sometimes referred to in Polish as Jan Czarnolasu, John of Blackwood. It was there that he wrote his most memorable works, including the dismissal of the Greek envoys and the laments. Kohanowski died, probably of a heart attack, in Lublin on August 22, 1584. <laughs> I have to mention the laments, which were the most known work of his. Yes, indeed. It is a very well-known work of Kochanowski. Of course, the ancients have already used this genre, for instance, Simonides or Pindar, but it was innovative in Poland because he dedicated this work to his child. It has never happened before in this form. A lament is a literary genre which expressed grief. It was supposed to be dedicated to honored people, and Kohanowski wrote 19 alleges which he dedicated to his daughter. His publisher, and at the time good friend of Kohanowski, Jan Januszkowski, was afraid that they would be rejected because it was an unusual piece of work for Poland, for sure. But when it comes to literature, Kohanowski was a very hardworking and brave man. He created many, many works. He was also tough-minded. There are numerous testimonies to prove it. For example, when he brought his epigrams to the publishing house, publishers didn't want to publish everything. They wanted to leave some of them because they were simply indecent. And they proposed doing a selection, but Kohanowski disagreed. He said that either they all would be published together as a whole, just like he wants, or none of them would be published. He managed to prepare a set of epigrams before his death. Not all of them were published in his lifetime because he was this kind of person who likes to improve that's already done. He was a perfectionist and he worked on his works for a long time. And it was thanks to his wife Dorota, of which we will talk about later, they were all collected and with the help of Jan Januszowski, which was the main publisher of Jan Kochanowski, in the next years various censored were made. In the 18th century, the collection of Jan Kochanowski's work selected as he wanted them to be were published. He selected his work for all kinds of reasons. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Poland Daily History. We are here at the city of Lublin, one of the most historical and largest cities of all of Eastern Poland. Today, we are going to the Catholic University of Lublin, a bastion of the anti-communist movement during the time when Poland is in the grip of the Soviet Union. It was also the home to Karol Wojtyla, who would later on become the Pope John Paul II. There, we will talk to a historian who specializes in 20th century history. In 1944, when the Red Army wrestled control of Lublin over from the Germans, I was wondering how it looks like for the residents here and what kind of dynamics between the citizens of Lublin with the Soviet occupants look like. No, niezwykle ciekawy czas. W tym czasie. That was an incredibly interesting time. In those years, the Home Army, so the most important underground force, who saw themselves as the continuation of the pre-war Polish state, were operating in Lublin and in the entire province of Lublin. During World War II, the Polish underground state was created and it was a legal continuation of the pre-war state of affairs. They had their own administration, courts and army. In July 1944, the Home Army 
attacked the retreating Germans. They also established several important defense points. As the Red Army was entering Lublin, the leadership of the Home Army and the leaders of the Polish underground state in Lublin stood up against the Soviets as hosts. After a short period of cooperation and common fight against the Germans, most of the Polish conspirators were arrested, while many were later sent to Siberia, deep inside the Soviet Union. They were accused of collaborating with the Germans. In short, the people who saw themselves as the continuation of the independent Poland were punished. Nevertheless, the situation looked a little different from the perspective of the common people. The Red Army was finishing the most evil part of the war, the part which resulted in horrible atrocities. I would say that the Red Army did not intend to bring freedom, as the soldiers were not free themselves. At the same time, the Soviets also brought the end to the vicious German occupation. Because of those factors, people who were in Poland and found themselves in this new reality would make different choices. Some of them decided to continue their conspiracy activities, often with guns in hand. For about two years after the end of the war, until 1947, there were still people who would engage in armed activity in the Lublin province and the city of Lublin itself. After 1947, this resistance would fade, with the last guerrilla fighter who was hiding and acted in secret against the communist rulers was killed only in 1963, so many years after the war. This date brings the symbolic end to the history of armed resistance. However, the Lublin province and the city itself played a major role yet again in 1944, since the new authorities, the communist rule, was established here in Lublin. Therefore, Lublin was the capital of communist Poland until Warsaw was liberated in January 1945. It played the role of the new center for the governing powers. Do wyzwolenia Warszawy w styczniu 1945 roku przez pół roku jest stolicą komunistycznej Polski, więc pełni rolę nowego centrum władzy. Lublin, as all major Polish cities, suffered greatly from the Second World War. After the end of the war, Lublin had to get back up on its feet. Next up, we will ask Professor Vnuk about the hurdles the inhabitants of Lublin faced when the communist system was imposed on Poland. So we do know that the Second World War is a devastating event for all of Poland and of course Lublin too. I was wondering how the, the city get back, got back on its feet and how does the social fabric look like after the war? How does it culturally? To is a different city. Przede wszystkim zniknęła ludność żydowska, która przed wojną stanowiła jedną trzecią tutejszej populacji. O ile It was a completely different city. First and foremost, the Jewish population, which constituted one third of the entire population of the city, disappeared. According to the data we possess, before the Second World War, Lublin's population counted about 120,000 citizens, one third of whom was Jewish. Meanwhile, after 19 45, that whole number shrunk down to around 80,000, with practically no Jewish population to speak of. Very few Jews survived the war in Poland, as we all know. Therefore, as I said, Lublin after the war was a completely different city. It was not as destroyed to the same extent as Warsaw, Gdańsk or Wrocław, however the damage dealt with it during military activities in 1939 or due to the deliberate destruction of the Vinyava and Jewish districts. Lublin, much more like other cities, rose from its knees relatively quickly, however it experienced a much different economic model to what the residents were accustomed to. From 1948 onwards, Moscow ordered Poland to veer off the course of the free trade market to instead incorporate the Stalinist economy model. It must be said that in comparison to other Polish cities, Lublin was rather lucky not to receive any big, poisonous industrial plants which were being created in cities across our country at the time. Subsequently, after 1956, which was a breakthrough year in Polish history, Lublin began developing in an 
interesting way. The newer districts of the city were designed well by the Lublin Housing Corporation. These districts were full of green areas, spots to spend time together. The city became lively and interesting, albeit modelled after Scandinavian solutions. We must, however, return to one very important point. As I said before, intellectual life was always a crucial party of the Lublin city life. For as much as the Catholic University of Lublin was built, in a sense, against the developing Jewish education facilities, after the war, the Jewish education was destroyed. What remained was the Catholic University of Lublin, holding a strong position. The new communist authorities soon came to dislike the fact that Lublin's intelligence will be educated at a Catholic university. They decided to set up a communist workers' university. This is the history behind the establishment of Marie Curie Skłodowska University. As a result, Lublin received a third major education center, yet again built out of spite. I znowu robiony komuś na złość. 1968 is a very tumultuous time in the whole European history, especially here in Poland. I know that it started around Warsaw, and I was wondering if the effects spread to Lublin. Rzeczywiście, 68 rok to jest rok niezwykle ważny, ważny także, ważny także dla Lublina. The year 1968 was immensely important, both for Poland and Lublin itself. That year was marked mostly by the students' rebellions which took place in Poland and the very city in question. That was the effect of the presence of the several scientific centers in one city, including the Catholic University of Lublin, or KUL, and the Marie Curie Skłodowska University. We must remember that KUL was a rather extraordinary institution. It was the only non state-run private university in the entire communist bloc. Simply put, there was not a single institution like this between East Berlin and the Kamchatka Peninsula. This was in part the effect of the strength of the Polish church, but also the effect of the fact that on many occasions the university was successfully defended from the communist authorities by the Vatican and the Polish church. When in 1968 students took to the streets in Warsaw in defense of freedom of speech and their Jewish peers who were being accused of treason against Poland, many students from Lublin joined them in demonstrations. A manifestation of students from Lublin, both from the Catholic University of Lublin and the Marie Curie Skłodowska University, took place where we are now. Lublin was lucky enough not to see a bloody pushback against the demonstrating students. However, a group of cool students were determined and accused of organizing a state revolt, a coup of sorts. The Catholic University of Lublin went down in history of Poland for one more specific reason. Those students who were expelled from their universities as a result of the 1968 strikes were allowed into Kuhl. As a result, a large group of young, active people arrived in Lublin and they created democratic opposition groups after 1976. In this sense, Lublin became an interesting city in Poland again on one hand due to it being a place of resistance, while on the other a place of intellectual fermentation. W polskiej historii jako miejsce, jako miejsce z jednej strony oporu, z drugiej strony intelektualnego fermentu. As we have seen today, Lublin has a very long, yet at times dramatic history. But places such as the Catholic University of Lublin sufficiently demonstrated the city spirit and their love for freedom. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee. I'll see you next time on Poland Daily History.
Welcome back to Poland Daily. And as the day is uh, coming to, towards sunset, moving towards sunset, I find myself here in the village of Mięcz, uh, Mięcz Miersz, Mięcz Miersz. And I hope my, my Polish friends will approve of that approximation of pronunciation. Um, interesting village because it's a, what they call in uh, the local uh, area, a living uh, skansen. It's a living museum of folklore. Uh, that is, uh, you've got uh, uh, old fashioned, old fashioned, what should I say, old school, old style village homes. Uh, there's a windmill here and uh, the sort of things that would have kept this village going uh, even uh, would have kept going in this village up until, uh, say, uh, the time of uh, 1939 and the beginning of the war. One very curious thing is there's a monument over here uh, to my left, which is a stone and inscripted on the stone it says that the treasure from Wawel Castle in Krakow in 1939, after the invasion uh, of Poland by Germany, the treasure from Wawel, or a certain percentage of that treasure, was brought here to this very village. It was brought in by a horse cart. Possibly they moved it along the, along the river, or who God knows how they got it here. Uh, but brought in by a horse cart, uh, and then it was smuggled further on down the line to Romania and finally to Canada, where it was held in safe keeping until uh, well after the war uh, was over. So here we are, and uh, there's a nice old boat. Looks like, uh, I don't know if it's seaworthy, but it's a nice looking wooden boat. Makes you want to get out there and paddle across. The, uh, the river. The town across here is, there's a, you can just see it. There's a uh, castle on the hill. It's called Janowitz. And uh, it's a Renaissance castle. It's, a, it's ruined, but it stands exactly across from us now. And there is a ferry, uh, unfortunately not running today, but running soon uh, as winter has uh, has just ended, um, and you can take your car across and go to Janowitz. Otherwise, you must go the long way and come around uh, to Poavi, uh, back through Kazimierz and Poavi. To get here, we've come from Kazimierz, we've gone over the hills and come down on a dirt track and an old cobblestoned road to get to this uh, really quite unique village. I think you're going to enjoy uh, seeing the photographs as we walk around and uh, try to give you some of the atmosphere. In fact, there's a, a beautiful fence right here. You can see it's just made of, of cut saplings or branches or, or young trees to make a fence here. And it's very effective and very attractive at the same time. And it's probably been here quite a long time. And behind that is a thatched roof house. Well, that's just an invitation to this beautiful piece of Polish uh, culture. And uh, what a nice place to travel to. It'd be interesting to see if we can find accommodation here. I bet that you can probably uh, rent a place in this village uh, for the right price. And I bet it's not too expensive. Anyway, we're going to ask around. We'll see what we can find out for you. But this is idyllic. What a great way to begin spring. And I'm glad that you're here with us on this unforgettable, beautiful Friday afternoon with Poland Daily. Okay, uh, stay with us. We're going to go and walk around the town. Poland Daily Travel, we do it for you, wherever we are. And right now, we're in Mięcz, Mierz, just over the hill from Kazimierz Dolne, one of the prettiest little villages you'll ever see. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
surprising discoveries like this stone over here, which is a remembrance of how the Vavil treasure from the castle in Krakow was taken to this village. I could not resist this stand-up. This is amazing. One of the best things about uh, doing my job and, and doing travel uh, documentation is when you find a surprise. And look at the view behind to the chateau. It's amazing. You can see the Janowicz and all its splendor. And over to them, this side is a windmill, old school uh, windmill. It has that look about it. It might be newer. But at any rate, uh, it's well positioned because this is where you catch the wind. And look at the, uh, we're on a very high bluff here above the uh, Vistula River. It's, uh, the wind is up and uh, you can just see over the, the floodplain here, across the whole river valley as the sun is, is setting in the west. So we know we're looking east and towards Lublin and back towards Kazimierz Dolna and this sort of direction. And uh, really, it is, it is wonderful here. And Miench mar Marsh, Miench, Miersch, Miench, Miersch, I think you'll agree, it's easy for me to say. I think you'll agree, boy, what a mouthful, that uh, uh, it is a very interesting place. And uh, lots of land for sale around here, by the way. You wouldn't think so. So you gotta get a little bit off the beaten track. Even talk to a nice man who's a neighbor here, who let us pass through his field uh, to come and uh, stand here on the edge. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's substantially high. We're probably, uh, I don't know. We're probably 50 meters above, above the, uh, the bank of the Viswa here. And uh, that's, uh, that's pretty nice. So, from us at Poland Daily, and from me, and from my great crew, Vlad and Tom and Vova. You can, you can say it out loud. And Vova, <laughs> we say hello from, uh, from here on the, the banks of the Viswa. Poland Daily. Watch it. We're having a lot of fun today. Hope you're enjoying seeing this beautiful stuff. Come to Poland.